And welcome to our favorite night of the week as we get ready for a holiday weekend. Welcome to Wagner Webcast Live. I'm Brian Bushlack, your host, and we've got Leonard and Lorena there at the home office in Anacortes. I think Mark may join us by phone if we if we get lucky. We got our fingers crossed. Uh, but if he doesn't, we've got an update for you from uh, Leonard and Lorena. Where is Mark, and can you give us any updates on the Alaska flotilla? Exactly. So, uh, Lorena, let's go with where he's at right now. He is in Shearwater right now, which is in northern D.C. It's like an oasis in the middle of nowhere. They have fuel and groceries and a pub, and every boater stops there on, the, on their way north. In fact, we just talked to Mark, and he's in the pub, and he hopes to join us by phone here. But uh, we do have some photos from uh, previous stops they've made along the way. So we will share those with you here. All right. Yeah, so uh, the fact that he's in the bar may be the reason, the reason <laughs> that we're not seeing him. <laughs> I was going to say that, but I, hey, thank you for <laughs> mentioning that letter. <laughs> uh, some pictures from, uh, from part of the flotilla on the way up. This happens to be... Um, Preto Haven, the boat, the uh, the group of uh, nine boats, ten boats, I guess it is, ten boats in total, and uh, obviously Stern Tide and Preto Haven, and uh, this is uh, one of the members as they were getting themselves Stern Tide. Part of the part of the flotilla is to get to learn how to do Stern Tide, have a group there with a little bit of instruction and some help. Uh, we've done the Stern Tide ourselves. Uh, on our boat, just the two of us. And it's a, it's a bit of a challenge when you only have two people yeah. trying to move the boat, keep it in place, and uh, somebody else taking the dinghy and running that uh, line all the way up to shore. So it's very welcome to have some other people helping with us. And the next one here is Brito Haven uh, again. This is Desolation Sound area, if I didn't say that. And Desolation Sound north uh, on the uh, north end of the Strait of, uh, Strait of Georgia. And this one happens to be uh, out of Preto Haven a little bit, looking scenery, uh, the scenic backdrop off of Desolation Sound, which is absolutely stupendous. Uh, I've never seen a more beautiful picture right there than that, that view from Preto Haven and Desolation Sound. And obviously some kayakers there having a great time. This happens to be the flotilla group on uh, Johnstone Strait. This is part of the flotilla group. And part of the reason for this picture is to show that the, during the, the transit going up and in, and with the flotilla, uh, the boats sometimes are following along in a, in a loose fashion of some sort, but not everybody. So there's not 10 boats there. Some boats went ahead, uh, somebody else went off on a side trip and came back. So in, uh, in addition to having somebody lead this and have a group to go with, a social group to get together with for potluck dinners, uh, you're not always together on that one. And this one happens to be uh, on Johnstone Street. One of the one of the people in the group, one of the groups, uh, or one of the boats in the group, uh, was scouring the shore along Johnstone Street and uh, discovered this black bear with three little cubs there. Wow! Obviously, did not go on shore yeah. on that one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And uh, this one is Lagoon Cove. Uh, this is in the Broughtons, and this is one of the favorite stops I think for everybody in the Broughtons. Lagoon Cove was. Uh, has been there for a long time. It changed hands about three or four years ago and the new new owners are, uh, we applaud them because they're doing an absolutely spectacular job of keeping the traditions going that have been there in the past and improving the place and bringing some new stuff to it. One of the things that they're doing here, this, this by the way is one of those locations where in the past it's always the internet connection has been through satellite, very slow satellite communication. And the, uh, the new Starlink, which is the uh, new satellite stuff, uh, this is just coming online and these folks have one ordered. It's apparently due to be installed any day, uh, which would Im should improve the connection point uh, all on the wilderness. It may be a good news and a bad news because now you have to respond to all those emails. You don't have an excuse anymore to say, I can't do that. And this again is Lagoon Cove and this is the flotilla group. Uh, as they are off on the left there, where you see the tent of the uh, umbrellas, is the where they usually prepare the prawns. And there's a potluck dinner every night out there. Every night there's, a, I shouldn't say happy a potluck hour. dinner, yeah. a happy hour. Uh, and so there's usually some fresh prawns there for you to, to uh, sample. And uh, while the great conversation goes on. And of course, Mark, and this is uh, Billy Proctor. And he's a fixture at Echo Bay, near Echo Bay. 
This is his one of his museum uh, buildings that he has there. And Billy's looking good. Uh, Mark said he's 80. In his late 80s, he was a trapper, hunter, fisherman, boater. He has a tremendous history of growing up and working in this area. And he's collected lots of things over the years. And this is Echo Bay. And this is, we're looking more at uh, Cliffside here. Just the boats right down in the lower, kind of the lower right corner is our Echo Bay. And that's uh, part of the flotilla group there. But this is a beautiful picture taken by one of the drone uh, drone that they have on board, and that's the set of pictures. That's where uh, the flotilla is at. Looks like they're having a great time. Yeah. So let's talk about this trip. I mean, you've done this so many times, and we don't have Mark to share the experience, but you've done this, and you know, for a lot of folks who may be new to boating, what a great way to become accustomed to it, right? It is, and for us, it's the people as you head north in northern BC and in southeast Alaska, they, they are so friendly and helpful and of course self-sufficient and that's what you really learn to appreciate and enjoy. So it's the people as well as the scenery, it's fabulous. Another added bonus there is uh, with Mark leading that, we've always said Mark seems to know everybody in the nautical industry. And so with Mark leading that and his ability to introduce, introduce the group people you get some pretty unique experiences so it's a great thing to do we highly recommend it well and as he's always mentioned too you know he, he takes you up but you got to find your own way back and i think you know you learn you talk about stern tying and i mean it's a challenge right and that could be something if you tried it on your own for the first time right as i'm sure you did right very difficult We've had a question here in the chat about uh, can Mark give us an update on gas and diesel prices, and uh, we will uh, we will do that. I'm just uh, well, I'm trying to figure out where we will post that actually because um, we'll have to do that after we get off here and get a hold of Mark. We might try to do that. Uh, I might be able to text him here, and, and we'll try to get that. We'll try to get an answer for you. If we don't get it here during the during the session. Uh, we'll uh, we'll actually put something out on the updates table. We'll add an entry in there with uh, gas and uh, diesel and uh, fuel prices. That may not be today, so check back tomorrow. But we'll uh, uh, that's a it's a great question, and we do need to answer that. In answer to your question, yes, the flotilla. You learn a lot about anchoring as well as stern tie, and just practice, practice really. Every time, the more experience you have, the easier it becomes. So that's all part of, of learning is doing it over and over again. Yeah. Yeah, we, get, we need like a gas buddy app for boaters, right? It sounds like that's what people want. So there's your project for this week. <laughs> <laughs> sounds like it. As if you didn't have enough to do already. Now, I know you're getting ready to head out on your boat. And uh, where are you guys planning to go in the next couple of weeks? Uh, start out in the Gulf Islands. So BC, we need to get uh, over to some of the places that weren't, we weren't able to cruise to uh, in the last two years. Uh, we had last year when we went to Southeast Alaska, we had to do the transit through and that was just burning straight through. They didn't want to stop in any, anywhere. So we did exactly as they asked and we didn't get to stop at any of the places. So, so we'll be scouring BC locations, keep going north, northern BC and make a circuit around to get as many updates and all the changes that we need for the next edition of the wagon. Great. We need to get some out in the field. And speaking of uh, updates, <laughs> Rena, I know you've got some Washington Marina updates for us. I do. Uh, Arabella's Landing Marina in uh, South Sound and Gig Harbor, that's a favorite destination. And they have both permanent moorage and guest moorage. And they now have a new online reservation system. So you can go in check to see what slips are available, the size of the slip. So that's a nice addition there. And then Foss Harbor Marina in Tacoma on the Foss Harbor Waterway, another uh, nice destination. They also now take reservations online through Dock Walk. And then the docks at Dockton Park in Quartermaster Harbor, also South Sound. They've completed the inner dock, so they are available. They were going to be available earlier, but because of supply chain issues, uh, it wasn't quite ready. And they tell us that it will be open this Memorial Day weekend. So that's good news. And they will start on the um, breakwater in 2023. The restroom on the new docks 
are open and the restroom up in the park is open and that includes showers. And then uh, Blakely Island Marina and the San Juan Islands, they are scheduled to open May 30. Great. Okay. Yep, you're next. So uh, we're, up, we're on to updates on the border and uh, the Canada border. And actually we have an update on the US border as well. So uh, as reported last week, the Bedwell Harbor Customs Clearance Point is open. That opened on May 20th. Yeah. Uh, and then uh, there are other sites that are open too. There's for a complete list, there's a CBSA website. And we're gonna put that in the chat. Uh, and the reason I emphasize that, if you, if you, in the past, if you went out and you said you did a search on Google on CBSA small craft reporting sites, it took you to a location that ha that did have used to have a list, a very a complete list. Uh, that website, for some reason, is broken right now, and it does not show the marine crossings. It shows you the land and the air crossings. There, the whole list. But we did find a, uh, a website address, and we'll put that in the chat so you can go take a look. And the ones that are in that list. Uh, are the ones that are active. And again, it does include Bedwell Harbor. We'll also have there a telephone number for general border information, uh, which we have been in the past, we've been able to get through and actually talk to somebody. Uh, not, we don't always get exactly the succinct answer we're looking for, but but give it a try. They're, they try, They're, everybody's trying very hard on this. Yeah. And by the way, I have, I have a related uh, story about, uh, in fact, I'll do it right now. The, so uh, we're going to put this in the chat, and this article comes credit uh, credit to uh, Boating Industry of Canada and the editor, which is Andy Adams. It's out on our website on wagonerguide.com. It's all about uh, how this uh, how the, the border crossing entry points that were not open during COVID, how they got them opened again. The article that was posted out there on uh, by Canada Marine Trade Association was actually uh, called, it was titled a close call. The close call was that B CBSA was not going to open those for the summer. And uh, the uh, Canadian uh, Trade Marine Trade Association, along with Tourism Association and one of the uh, yacht clubs actually uh, spearheaded an initiative to CBSA to say, hey, we need to have these places open. Yeah. Uh, there's gonna be a flood of boats. So we have to credit these people for, for getting the border crossings open. And that's why we also didn't get early warning of this and they just happened all of a sudden. The um, also wanted to, on the border crossings, the Canadian border crossing nexus, we've been trying to discover whether the, ex, whether the expedited crossing process where you report in uh, 30 minutes to up, up to four hours ahead of your point, the point when you're gonna arrive at a destination, uh, we've been trying to figure out whether that's available, the expedited crossing. And we have an indetermined answer on that. One person in CBSA said, yes, it's available. And another one said it's not. So at this point, we don't know. And that again is the process where if you're, if everybody aboard has Nexus cards, you can telephone ahead to an 800 number. And we'll put that in the chat, the 800 number for Nexus and you report that your uh, the destination and your ETA destination meaning the report your um, customs point that you're going to arrive at yeah. one of the sites and you can have up to four hours so in that 30 minute to four hour window you give them a time when you're going to arrive and then you arrive and wait until the ETA time if no agent shows up then you're free to go you have an uh, you have your clearance number and you're free to go Again, we, it's, we don't know whether that's available. We would ask that if, if you have Nexus and if you try this and if you discover that it does work, please send us an email. Uh, we'd love to hear back and, and learn whether, you're, whether the people are successful at this. And the other one is a US Customs. Uh, we had somebody that uh, is, has just in the last day or two cleared Customs uh, from Prince Rupert up into Canada, into, into, uh, into Southeast Alaska, I'm sorry, Southeast Alaska. And they cleared in using the CBP Rome app before they left Prince Rupert. So while they were still in good cell phone coverage in Prince Rupert, they were able to use the CBP Rome app and Ketchikan, okay. uh, we had understood, Ketchikan is fine with that, that you can hit the report arrival button while you're still in Canada. Hmm. Now that the case here when you come back into Washington waters, the Washington people here want don't want you to hit that report arrival button until you're in U.S. waters. Mm. So it's a procedure in Canada and uh, Southeast Alaska than it is down here. 
And the uh, this one's kind of uh, had a fun one here. We're going to do a share screen on this one. Uh, so this happened. This came out of a local notice to Mariners that showed up today. And this happens to be this red area is an area out in the Pacific that you don't want to be in uh, at tonight at uh, between 11:30 p.m. Uh, excuse me, between 10.30 p.m. and 11.30 p.m. tonight, some space debris is going to come somewhere in this area, uh, is, is the report on the local notice to Mariners. And now, the interesting part is that uh, they just issued the alert today, so that's obviously a gigantic area, and if you were in that area, I have no idea how you'd figure it out, but other than watching the debris come down. The other one I was curious about was if we had a clear night out tonight, whether we'd be able to see any any trails of, uh, of debris coming down, but unfortunately, I don't think we're going to get a chance to see that. But I thought that was a fun one. We scoured the uh, local notice to Mariners regularly, and this is one another one of those where you're going to go. That's kind of interesting. And they didn't they didn't say if it's like Russian space junk or you know from China or it just it's just coming down. So get out of the way, right? It says space. Spacecraft reentry operations, operations. I like that one. <laughs> Hazardous debris is what it says. <laughs> well, well, we know it's not SpaceX, so that's that's good to know. Um, thanks for those updates. We'll have Eric uh, coming up here in just a little bit uh, from the Tula Foundation. But before we do that, uh, I know Lorena, you've got some BC Marina updates. We do. Uh, Otter Bay Marina in the Gulf Islands on North Kinder Island. They just opened. And you can make reservation requests online. Secret Cove on mainland Sunshine Coast, they open as well now. And you can make reservations online. And their Upper Deck Restaurant, which is popular, is open Thursday through Monday from 2 to 9 p.m. And there is a different phone number to make dining reservations. And that is in our updates table on wagonerguide.com forward slash updates. So you can look for it there. And then Quatsi Bay, another favorite destination. It does remain closed. There's a rumor going around that the new owners might have it open this summer, uh, but we confirmed that no, it is. it remains closed for the season and the new owners have not started construction or maintenance yet on that facility. Of course, you can still anchor in beautiful Quatsi Bay. And then uh, Port Alberni Yacht Club, which is in beautiful Barclay Sound on the west coast of Vancouver Island. They are open, it's first come, first served. And Hot Springs, north of Tofino, that remains closed and likely will not open. In Northern BC, native uh, community of Klemtu, this fuel dock is open, stores open, and moorage is available on a limited basis. They ask that you wear masks. Masks are required there. And then Hartley Bay, another native village, a lovely spot. Their fuel dock is open. They have not yet made a determination on if they are opening moorage in their village to non-residents, so we're still waiting to hear on that one. <clears throat> and then one last notice here for pet owners. Uh, pet owners should be aware that there is a rare flesh eating bacteria going around. Unfortunately, some dogs in Parksville and Nanaimo have become ill and it is a fatal disease. So um, the symptoms are fever and pain and apparently this bacteria gets in under the skin through a cut or um, a scrape or puncture wound, something like that. So uh, it's rare, but keep your eyes out, keep your dogs with you, keep them on a leash, make sure they're not hurt or scratched and that type of thing, and they should be fine. Okay. Wow, that's, uh, that's interesting. Um, all right, time for our special guest this evening, Eric Peterson and Lorena, I'll hand off to you. Uh, well, Eric, he, he has a fascinating background and uh, it, his background and experience for Shadow, the Tula Foundation, it, it's obvious why he got this started. He, uh, he comes from a family of teachers and engineers. He grew up in the Saanich Peninsula, on Vancouver Island. He worked a variety of jobs and traveled up and down the West Coast from Southern California to Alaska. 
and also to Central and South America. And he then pursued a career in biology, starting at the University of British Columbia, then a PhD in England and a postdoctorate in Harvard. Uh, he then landed a faculty job at McGill University in Montreal in 1982. And he decided he preferred the tech sector rather than the academic life, so he moved to Ontario where he and his wife, Christina, founded their own business in 1990 called Mitra. And the business, uh, very interesting, the business combined computers and automation for the health industry. It helped hospitals move their medical imaging from x-ray film and light boxes to computer networks and workstations. By 2001, Mitra had hundreds of employees and offices in the US, Europe, and Asia Pacific. After growing the business and putting in some very long hours, he accepted an offer to sell the business and he all of a sudden found himself retired. And like most entrepreneurs, he wanted to give back to the community. And so he started the Tula Foundation where he combined teaching, engineering, and science with his organizational skills. And it's been a big success the Hakai Institute, begun in 2007, is Tula's coastal science program. And the Tula Salud, started in 2003, is the public health program in rural regions of Guatemala. Eric has maintained his local roots. Uh, he has a strong presence in science, both regionally, nationally, and now globally, but with a connection with the United Nations and other partners. So, we're very happy to welcome Eric Peterson. Eric. Great. So should, should I share my screen now? Yes. <laughs> We're looking <laughs> forward to this. Okay. So I hope we're up and underway. Is that fine? That's Looks good. great. Yeah. Great. Okay, so uh, it's really great to be here, and I'll try to get, I've got quite a lot of material, I'll try to get through it and leave, a few, I leave some time for questions if I can handle it. So, I, I, what I would say is I probably have a lot in common with a lot of people who are watching, uh, watching this, uh, this webinar, because we all love the ocean, we love, all love being out on the water. Uh, we just heard my bio, and uh, you'll know that I grew up on the Salish Sea, and I lived and worked and traveled all over the Pacific Coast moved away um, and uh, then came back about 15 years in the tech sector. And then in 2002, my wife, Christina and I started the Tula Foundation. And at that time, having been all over the place, we were free to live anywhere. And what we did is we chose to come back to the Pacific coast after about three decades away. Now, during that time, we became serious boaters. And so uh, the main thing that we did was uh, probably like a lot of you, uh, wait for, for summer to come around, figure out where we're gonna go. Uh, we went up to Alaska, all the way to Glacier Bay. We went around Haida Gwaii. We went all around Vancouver Island a few times and we've been most places around the Salish Sea on both sides of the border. So uh, again, from that point of view, we've got an awful lot in common. And I think we all agree, uh, just an amazing part of the world on, on, on both sides of the border. So in some ways, we knew that the Tula Foundation had to find some sort of a mission on, in this beautiful landscape in, in coastal science and conservation. So in order to define a mission, I've, I've, I sort of go at it in this way. I have to process a lot of information in the work that I do and have to make timely decisions. So I always kind of tell people it's all about the what, the so what, and the now what. And the what is, you know, tell me clearly and concisely what the issue is. The so what is, tell me why it's so important and urgent. And then the, the third part is a really important part is, now what? What are we going to do about it? So in terms of defining a mission, we go through those, those, those three steps. Now, if I looked at ocean science and conservation on our coast, it just seemed to me that the what and the so what were obvious. Uh, the what, as we see around it, is the world's oceans are changing rapidly with climate change, pollution, overfishing, et cetera. I don't think anybody, you know, you'd want, don't need to ask the people on this call the so what, and that means the planet as we know it now depends upon healthy oceans. 
we're already seeing, as much as we love the ocean, we're already seeing negative impacts of change. Sea level rise, extreme weather, declining biodiversity, collapsing fisheries, and communities in crisis. So for us, given the what and the so what, the now what is always the difficult part. Given the, resor the limited resources that, that we had as the Tula Foundation, how could we have an impact? So in terms, of, we choose a mission, or I've decided to choose a mission based upon our cert special circumstances and capabilities. So we kind of do an inventory of what are those skills that we have. First of all, we knew how to work with scientists, universities, and government. Been doing that for many, many years. So uh, even though I, I was a scientist a long time ago, I'm not a scientist now, but I know how to work with scientists. Uh, the other thing is I knew how to organize fairly complex activities, organizations, and facilities. I run companies with hundreds of people. And the other thing that's kind of interesting is from growing up on the coast and having spent so much time here, I was really at home working off the grid in this part of the world that I felt very comfortable in, uh, but I would realize that other people coming into this environment might feel kind of unsettled working there. So I had that kind of combination of uh, fairly sophisticated capabilities, but being really quite comfortable on the landscape because I'd grown up here. So I felt that we had a mission and that mission was to expand science on the remote central coast of British Columbia, which for reasons I'll say was a little bit of a neglected area for science. So tremendous opportunity for science where not a lot of science was being done. So when you kind of scratch your head and say, well, okay, we're gonna do something here. First idea we had was we thought we could start by, well, why don't we just start by supporting the scientists who are already working up there? Uh, so we kind of, we asked around and we found out, actually, there weren't very many scientists who were working on the, on the Central Coast uh, 15 years ago. And if I said why, it wasn't because they didn't want to. Uh, they'd say, well, you know, it's very difficult to work up there. Uh, there are no resources and the conditions are very tough. We did find a few pioneers, some few willing souls in those early years who were working and doing science on the Central Coast. But for me, it was kind of painful to, uh, to watch them work. Uh, the work was there was very sporadic. There wasn't a lot of organization. They didn't really have much in the way of logistics. There wasn't a lot of continuity from year to year. Uh, there was really no investment in scientific infrastructure. And, and from that point of view, there wasn't much of a long-term focus. And when I talked to uh, scientific people, they said, you know, that's unfortunately, that's our problem. Um, Nobody will fund long-term research up here and, and it's really not fashionable to, to put money into infrastructure. So there's, we have a problem there. So I thought, well, what the heck? Here's, a, here's an open opportunity for us. Here's a gap we could fill. Um, perhaps we could provide infrastructure and organization and trust that we could then catalyze great science from, from supplying that, uh, that necessary capability. As a little bit of a cliche, I guess, we'd say, you know, we will build it and they will come as far as, as science goes. So you do that, that kind of thing on that sort of faith. Now the question is, now what? What, what, what is the it that we're going to build? What's it look like? So, you know, in some general sense, I was, I've always been very inspired by the idea of a field research station. You know, I'd heard all about them. Uh, there were these wondrous stations in the Arctic. There were, there were fabulous stations in the tropics. Uh, there were mysterious uh, stations on the, on, on the top, on, on remote mountaintops. I really liked the idea of what it seemed to me, something that was missing in science at the time, and that is science committing to the long-term, place-based, really understanding a place, being multidisciplinary. So you bring in all sorts of different elements of, of science working together. And it's collaboration. I mean, from my point of view, that's the, that's the exciting thing about working is, while having lots of collaborators, working with uh, bringing skills together and, 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 and getting, getting a lot, getting big things done. And I was told it's really impossible to get that sort of work funded these days. I was even more convinced that it made sense for us to swim against the stream. And it was the right thing for us to do, partly because nobody else was doing it. So we kind of focused, we sort of created a focus on what our now what should be in order to catalyze science in a particular part of the, the world that I love. So we needed a plan, we needed logistics, we needed a base of operations. And I could think and I'd say, actually, you know, building from scratch would be a real nightmare with permits and everything else. So I looked for an alternative. One thing I, I worked out from my point of view, and I still think it's the same way, is the needs of scientists are a lot like those of fishermen. 
uh, you know, you, you need a place to stay. You need a place to keep your gear. You head out early in the morning with a plan in mind. Uh, sometimes you succeed, sometimes you get skunked. Uh, you come back at the end of the day uh, to, the, to, your, to your base. You have something to eat, you talk, you plan, you go to sleep, and you wake up in the morning and you do it again. The, uh, the infrastructure and organizational requirements needed to support science are not a lot different from those to, uh, to support fishing. So there were many fishing lodges around at the time and there's still quite a few of them. So my plan was, my search image, was to look for a down at the heels fishing lodge that I could pick up on the cheap and convert into a, a, a research station. So that was sort of my plan. Well, you know, of course I knew about Calvert Island. I knew about the Hakai Beach Resort. I'd been, a, I'd, you know, definitely been a tourist. Uh, it was a high end fishing lodge at the time owned by a South Carolina property developer. It had beaches, it had harbors, it had facilities unrivaled anywhere on the coast. I, I'm just, I'm not just saying it because even before we were involved there, I used to think this is an absolutely magic place. It's legendary. Um, and it was also very famous and it was had celebrities there. I knew that Rupert Murdoch had been there with his wife. I knew that Kevin Costner had been there. Uh, and uh, so, I mean, by all rights, it was way out of our league. Um, but I didn't know it at the time, and I don't think people really appreciated it at the time, but we were right on the heels of the 2008 financial crisis. So we had an owner who in the, in the uh, in, in, as, as we say, we had a motivated seller. And uh, so there was an opportunity there. So in September of 2009, uh, we closed the deal and started trying to turn this wondrous facility, uh, the Hakai Beach Resort, in, into the, uh, the, the Hakai Institute. So there we are, that's the plan. So we acquired the, um, talk about a, a, a resort that has a little bit of a troubled past. So we acquired the Hakai Beach Resort. Uh, you'd be quite interested to hear the story. It was a two week frenzy that we, uh, that we got involved. And uh, we only realized later after we were owners, that it was a bit, there was a few, quite a few complications that came along with uh, being the new proprietor of the place. Uh, and I would, I would say it was a place with a troubled past. And, and uh, so the site had been a significant First Nation settlements for tens of thousands of years. It's a very, very ancient settlement, a very important settlement on our coast. The archeological work that we've done subsequently has really demonstrated that. But in, you probably many of you know, 1862 was a tragic year for the coast of British Columbia. Uh, that was the smallpox epidemic. Uh, and the oral history has it that all the people who were living at um, the place where they, the Hakai Beach Resort was either perished or fled. And as it said, villages that had been there for thousands of years were now gone. So absolutely tragic, tragic event. Now, fast forward to 1926, um, the, uh, the existing 200 acre parcel that you see there in, 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 in the picture of, of, which is the current land base of, of the Hakai Institute was purchased from the government, from the crown, as we say in Canada, as quote, vacant land. Uh, and uh, the purchaser of the land who happened to be the provincial land surveyor, hoped that it would become a park shared by everyone. So it was kind of a noble, noble objective there. And, um, over the next 70 years, uh, the original purpose of the purchase was lost because, of course, the property passes from hand to hand and people die and things move on. And the site was through the, through the 20th century, through the 40s, the 50s and the 60s and the 70s. The site was used informally and was enjoyed, uh, enjoyed by, by many visitors. Suddenly, in the, and, uh, in the spring of 1992, it was apparent that a fishing lodge was being built on the site. Um, there were no permits, no consultation, no warnings, uh, no particular concern about the site's potential cultural importance, just the work was proceeding at a, at a, at a furious pace. Uh, I think the principle there was one that was fairly familiar to things that happened on our coast at that time is, you know, don't ask permission, ask forgiveness, and uh, just get in and get her done and it'll be and it'll all be worked out. Uh, it didn't sit well with an awful lot of people in uh, 1992, 1993. In early summer, there was a big protest 
by First Nations and many others who managed who stopped the work temporarily. Uh, there was then kind of an intervention and there was what we call the drive-by archaeological study that was concluded in, in really almost no time at all. And it was determined that there wasn't really anything that anybody need to worry about. And the work was allowed to proceed. Deep resentment against the lodge was established at that time and it kind of festered over the years. And again, there's lots of, I know, I know many of the people who ran the lodge, they had the best of intentions, but there was still, it's, it's like the, the original sin that sort of hung over the place. It created an awful lot of, of antipathy. So we come in there now, we're saying, okay, how can we, we have to operate, we have to make friends. Uh, we're, uh, we're, uh, we, we absolutely need to work with all the members of the community here. So we need to sort things out. So let's do an inventory of the kind of issues that we had to handle. That was right away in 2010, where we were, where we were on the landscape. So we recognized that the Hakai Beach Resort had been at war with BC Parks uh, since its inception in, in 1992. Uh, the resort had no permit to operate, as we discovered, and the dock was deemed to be illegal by, uh, by BC Park. So they wanted it, they wanted it shut down. So uh, it was in a precarious state. Um, boaters and other visitors, uh, at least I was, I was a boater and other visitor at that time, were frustrated by the limited access I could get to the coastal beaches, which being a British Columbia, I feel like I've got an inalienable right to walk on my beaches. So it was, uh, it was a bit difficult. I know people, there was, uh, uh, there were, but there were so many rules of regula uh, regulations. I felt really quite unwelcome in those years. And, and in fact, I, I, I stayed away. So I never went on the place in those years, but those were small issues compared to serious issues that we had at the start with the neighboring First Nations. They never agreed to the transfer of their traditional lands in, in the 1920s. Nobody told them about that. And they were very angry that construction of the resort had proceeded without any respect for their, for their cultural heritage. So there was a lot of ground to make up there. So, you know, you, know, I'm, I, you can probably tell what I'm like. It's okay, what's job one to do now here? So first thing we, we do is, okay, it was quite easy to clear up the, the, the issues with BC Parks. In fact, it took me 15 minutes sitting down with the park ranger to sort things out. Here was the deal. We would provide full and open access to the public. Um, no rules, no regulations, provided everybody behaves themselves and, and behaves as though they're in a park. And in return, BC Parks would give us our pyramid, uh, gave us our permits and bless the dock. So from, from that point forward, those problems went away. We had a great relationship with BC Park and the public has henceforth being, uh, and the relationship with the public too, I think, has been excellent in, in every way. And so we really enjoy working with parks and we really enjoy having the public come in, that's an asset. We immediately that spring uh, commissioned a thorough archeological study that included uh, professional archeologists and, and experts from the, from the First Nations. And we basically said, it's just like going to the dentist, come down, stay as long as you want, dig wherever you want, look wherever you want, ask whatever questions you want to want, want, want have. Let's do a full inventory. Let's find out what the problems are, see if there are things we have to mitigate, see what we need to, we need to, uh, to do to, to come forward. I wouldn't say that that solved all our problems, but it cleared the air and tensions eased and we sort of got to a point, at least we've, we've got a dialogue going. And we started the slow process of getting to know one another, finding common interests and working together. Um, I'd say uh, right now, if we're uh, in terms of our, we tend to be informal. We tend to work with our neighboring First Nations as you would any other neighbor and, and in, in partnerships. We just look for common ground. We look for friendship rather than a lot of, a lot of formality. So we work together with our First Nations neighbors in areas where we share an interest. Uh, and in particular area that we share an interest is with what I would call the professionals within the First Nations, the resource managers, the fisheries managers, the architectural specialists, uh, the people who are who are kind of their 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 scientists. So if we go around this picture, and these are just a few snapshots, just to give you a flavor of things. So in the top left there, we work a lot with the coastal guardian watchman. I'm sure many boaters have come across the coastal guard, guardian watchman where they go on the coast. The coast they do a fantastic job. They're the First Nations combination park rangers. Uh, you know, police force, uh, cultural, cultural um, um, uh, protectors, etc. So that's great. Just about every year since we've started, they've had their annual meeting at our place. So we get to, to meet them over the course of a few days, get to know them all, work together. And so that when we see them on the water and we're working together, we're, we're doing it as friends. 
If we move around then to, uh, I guess, seven o'clock on this picture, we'll see uh, that original archeological impact study that we did, basically because we had to, to clear the air, it turned out that that stimulated a huge amount of interest in archeology, span not so much at our site, but in the areas around that. And so that's turned out to be a very productive area of science and a very productive area of cooperation with First Nations. And so we've got El our good friend Elroy White down there and looking like an archeologist digging in a hole there, uh, who is a uh, Helsic archeologist from Bella Bella. And uh, Elroy was part of the original study we did at the place and he's continued to be a great friend. And so we worked together with him. So that's a, a wonderful point of contact with First Nations. We move around to four or five o'clock on the picture there, the guy with the big rockfish. Uh, that's um, their representatives of the Central Coast Indigenous Resource Alliance, which is a collaboration between the four Central Coast First Nations kind of get together for science to do scientific things, including monitoring rockfish and having some rockfish protected areas that they manage. Now that's a project that we don't actually work with them on. They, they, they can do the science themselves, but we provide a base of operation they can use our dive compressors because they do diving so they can come in and use all of our resources they can get fuel from us and generally work together so it's a little bit like you were mentioning Shearwater as an oasis up there for them our place is a little bit of an oasis after a hard day in the, the spring or the fall monitoring rockfish to, to come back to our place then finally if we come up to one o'clock in this picture Yes, we work with the scientific people in the communities, but we really like to work just with communities. And we love to work with the kids. My wife in particular uh, works with schools. And so we kind of get to know, not just, so we're not sitting across the table negotiating with our First Nations. We're working together, uh, meeting the kids, meeting the parents, and, and just uh, basically trying to be good neighbors and find ways to work, work together and things to complain about, like you do when you're living in an area like that. There's always issues to complain about. So let's go back now to this, uh, now this base of operations that I had in mind at, uh, to, uh, to, to, to build from the, from the Hackai Beach, uh, Beach Resort. So what we say, and people say about our place, there's an aerial view of the, the site on Calvert Island. They say, you know, actually, you know, the Calvert Island field station is a little bit like the research vessel that never puts to sea. And so in some cases, um, uh, running, because I know what it's like to run a ship. It's very much like running a ship when you're up there. You're completely off the grid. You gotta have your own fuel. You gotta have your own power supply. You gotta make your own water. Uh, you know, you're, you're, you're basically, you're, you're really like a ship. The only thing is you're not, you're not putting to sea. Just like on a ship, everything's gotta be ship shape. Everything's gotta be neat and tidy. And if you let things go, then pretty soon you're, you're, uh, you're, in, you're in trouble. So when I look down at that aerial view, I say, doesn't it look so nice and I'm quite proud of it. Doesn't it look so nice and tidy? It looks really nice and ship shape. It almost looks like a ship that's kind of itching to, to go to sea, but it's, uh, you know, it's, it's tied to the land there. So that's, that really is the mentality of the place, the, uh, the research special that never puts to sea. Well, okay, let's continue that metaphor. <clears throat> the ship that we took on in 2000 and, uh, 2009, 2010, I have to say it looked pretty spiffy when it was the backdrop for Kevin Costner. But when my wife and I actually took it over and started actually looking at it properly, we realized that it was going to need a thoroughgoing refit to bring all systems and services up to required standards. You know, supporting some fishermen for a few weeks of the year is not the same as having a year-round operation where you really are you really are pushing the thing. So we really had to in those in those first two years we really had to rebuild everything there. So. When we look back on it, you know, those first years, say the first years are a blur. It's amazing to think how much we got done. Uh, we were, man, maybe people came through during that time. It was like a whirlwind of activity. We're fueled by inspiration, improvisation, feverish activity, somehow manning, man, managing to maintain some sort of quality and continuity. I look back on that. We had so much talent working with us and it wasn't exotic talent. It was tradesmen, craftsmen, technicians and almost all of them drawn from the north end of Vancouver Island, from the smaller islands and from the central coast of British Columbia, where, as you know, if you travel up there, you can probably sense there's a huge amount of ingenuity and, and, and dedication to figuring out how to do things right in, in a difficult environment. Uh, we're all working collaboratively, really a tremendous, one of the best experiences of my life, 
everybody willing to, you know, haven't done it before, stretch, try to learn something new, always exceeding expectations. You may be able to see, if you've been to the site, or you may see from that picture there, a whole bunch of solar panels. Uh, we were really early adopters in terms of creating off-grid uh, uh, solar system there. And it was, we learned, we, we didn't bring in experts, we learned how to do it. So it was, it was fantastic. So, and I'm extending the metaphor, anybody who knows, who owns a vessel of any size knows that the work is never done. And so keeping uh, the Calvert ship in tip top condition is a, is a constant challenge every year. As you know, it's just like with a boat, you look at it in the spring and figure out what are you, what are you going to, or in the wintertime, what are you going to have to do to get it back on, back on the water again. And every year we don't just try to stay in place. We strive for improvement. So for example, we've used the two COVID years to really where things, there was a little bit of a pause there and not so much other stuff to do. So we learned those, use those years to build up our capacity to grow our own food, which uh, is really the, the bailiwick of my wife, Christina. So that if you are fortunate enough to go up to Calvert this year and you have an opportunity and you're nice, talk to her. I'm sure that she will take you around and, and show off uh, this, this particular uh, aspect of things because it's quite phenomenal and it's just um, amazing, uh, amazing uh, what's been done. So we need to have a scientific mission now that we've got our, we've got our ship. So we needed to carefully build up our research partners, grow our scientific staff, always concentrating on our mantra, that long-term place-based multidisciplinary research. So we call it an ecological observatory to emphasize that mission that we're observing and we're observing things carefully and for the long-term. We look for important topics that we're particularly well-placed to tackle given our particular location and our particular expertise. So over the decade, we've done that step by step. So we've enjoyed really, really great partnerships with researchers from the universities, initially BC, but then from elsewhere in the Pacific Northwest and, and really increasingly across the world. So if you look at the top picture there on partnership, you see, I don't know, it's about 50 or 60 scientists there. They've all shown up at Calvert Island uh, for a three week, what's called a bio blitz, which is like a search and destroy mission, find as many uh, species as you possibly can within that time and tabulate them all to kind of establish a baseline inventory. Very exciting process. We've also established great partnerships with government science agencies. So you see a picture there of the, the that's the, the Hakai Express uh, meeting the big uh, department, uh, the Tully, the, uh, the, um, uh, the Department of Fisheries and Oceans Canada research vessel. The, the, it's, it, we're sort of have a four sort of view that Tully is so huge compared to that little boat, it's amazing. But we're both working, we're both doing the same job and we're coordinating up there. The Tully does the deep ocean, we do the coastal ocean. I could have had a similar picture there showing the NOAA vessel, uh, the Ron Brown coming into our place, again on a, on a sampling mission. And we met side by side with the Brown and we did, we did sampling together. So this is not just a, a Canada Hakai collaboration. It's a Canada and, and both sides of the border and all of the agency collaboration up there, which is, which is fantastic. We've also built up, of course, our own scientific and technical staff. And we like that a really nice mix of, of early career, energetic people and build a strong base and, and experience as well to go with that. And we build on a strong base of local talent, but we also were recruiting from across the coast. We have many Americans working with us and, uh, and, and around the world. So we, we're actually getting, they were really able to attract quite a bit of talent, which is fantastic. So around 2015, uh, we decided to create a second ecological observatory on Quadra Island at the north end of the Salish Sea. So anybody who goes north, you know where Quadra is because you can't go north without going on one side of Quadra or the other, as far as I know. So uh, the work on Quadra kind of complements what we do on Calvert, but of course that part of the world is different. So we study slightly different things. And we also have more of an emphasis on laboratories and experimentation because we're a little bit closer to the grid. So we've got a picture of it there. It's, uh, it's, it's, a, it's an interesting place. We have additional offices in Campbell River and Victoria, and then we have research clusters at the University of British Columbia in Vancouver and the University of Northern British Columbia in Prince George. So what do we study? That's, of course, when anybody comes ashore, they say, what do you study here? And I say, well, I, how long do you have? I can't tell you everything we study, so I can only give you kind of a little bit of a, of a, of a snapshot. We're always, I'll repeat this over and over again, we're always faithful to our mission of long-term place-based multidisciplinary research. We want to do a few things, and we want to do them well, and we want to do them wrong long-term, and we want to do them from a number of different points of view. 
we don't just study the ocean, we study the coastal margin and the ocean. So everything from the coastal glaciers to the edge of the continental shelf. That picture that we have there, which is right by, by Quadra Island, kind of illustrates that. You can see the glaciers in the background and then we're all the way through to the coastal ocean. I say, um, I say, when people ask me, they say, guess what? You know, the ocean starts right up there at the glacier because it does. What's happening to the glacier in terms of melt and everything else has got a profound effect on, effect on the ocean. So we do that. Uh, so we look at, I'll just give you a little bit of a survey here. Physics and chemistry, obvious of the ocean. We look at marine heat waves. We look at low oxygen in the ocean. We look at ocean acidification. I've got a slide that, that, that talks about that in detail. We use all sorts of different devices, some of them quite sophisticated, like the ocean glider in the picture here, which is like a drone, goes down underneath the ocean right out to the, to the deep ocean off the continental shelf and comes back again. Amazing. Uh, we have moorings uh, in terms of buoys. We get out there and do old school sampling. Uh, um, and we also have instrumentation on the Alaska Ferry, which I'll talk about it, and part of a network of devices all across the coast. But we don't neglect biology and biodiversity. We've got there, we've got a particular focus on the near shore, on the intertidal areas and the subtidal areas that we can reach by scuba divers. Why do, we, why do we study that area? Because we can because that's the area that we've got the, uh, the resources and the technology to, to, to study. We can't get down there way deep in the ocean, so we, we, con we concentrate on what we have. And we favor studying things that we can monitor effectively. Invertebrates, kelps, seagrasses, et cetera. They're nice because they stay put and you can count them and you can measure them and you can look really carefully at how they're changing year over year. So they're quite convenient to do science on. They're very, very important ecologically as well. And we also now, uh, collect environmental DNA, which I don't, I probably, maybe none of you know, know, but it's like CSI for, for uh, you know, for, uh, for biodiversity. You can collect DNA all over the place in the landscape and determine elusive, more elusive uh, uh, creatures that you can, you can learn about by doing eDNA. We also study our coastal watersheds and in particularly our deep fjords. And I'm sure many of your boaters love going up those deep fjords. And we use a full range of geospatial technologies, uh, including airborne, uh, surveying methods, satellite technology that really allows us to, uh, to uh, you know, to to uh, to get up on the landscape and study things, study things like the beautiful glacier that you see there, which is right at the top of Knight's Inlet. Um, so that's amazing. Um, increasingly, over the last year, because of all of the havoc that climate change has been creating in terms of receding glaciers and landslides and floods and everything else. We've had all of a lot of our technology and a lot of our capability has been called into service in British Columbia to deal with um, you know, tracking floods and damages and, and being involved in, in disaster relief. Uh, so it's a little bit like we put down our scientific tools and, and, and work in the public interest. We're very, very happy to do that. And we're happy to, um, you know, happy to be involved in that, uh, ready to serve whenever, whenever we're asked. And then finally, I don't have a picture of it, but archaeology and ancient biodiversity, starting from our original archaeological impact study, that has been some of the work that we've done. It never occurred to me we, we, we would end up doing anything like that, but that's been some of the best received work that we've done. And frankly, that, those have been our hit records. We get, we get published and, and, and uh, stories that circulate around the world on a lot of that. So that's been really quite interesting. So. I sort of feel after a decade, um, I thought to myself, well, it's a little bit like mission accomplished in a way. We've got an awful lot done of what we wanted to do. So when we were sort of a couple of years ago, kind of pivoting and saying, you know, we're entering the 2020s now, it's a new decade, what's next? You know, and that's sort of the thing that happens at the start of a new decade, you've been working for 10 years on something. You've, I, I think everything we've done had exceeded our expectation. What comes next? Uh, you know, more of the same or in our second decade, or are we going to think of something new to do? Then, of course, the COVID came along and it gave us a little bit of time to pause and think. And I think some people had that opportunity. It's like a little bit of a time for reflection because you're not quite so busy, busy, busy. And uh, so we asked the question kind of second to the bottom. I say it kind of a little bit tongue in cheek. You know, what do we want to be when we grow up uh, scientifically? And, uh, and the answer, I think, is that we do want to grow up scientifically in our next decade. And I think what that means is having more impact and maybe working a little bit on a larger scale. So I'll kind of then make a kind of a pivot toward where we've been and, and where we want to get to. So our plan for the 2020s is to keep our local, local roots strong, but expand our scale and impact. So we absolutely do not want to say goodbye to the 
strong, strong local presence that we have in science, that long-term place-based um, multi uh, uh, e ecological research. So that's still in our DNA. We are not giving that up. It's a question of what more should we do? We're starting to think, you know, we could maybe have more of a regional, you know, I can look at that and I can say we're very strong on Calvert Island, we're very strong on Quadra Island. There's an awful lot of the BC coast, which is also important that we should be able to be making some sort of a contribution to that. Now, we do not have the resources to study the BC coast in, in, in any kind of detail, but we can form partnerships, we can form collaborations with other organizations that can, and maybe we can try to recruit other partners to kind of work together on this kind of thing. So maybe we can take a little bit more of a leader, leadership in expanding over that wider landscape. We're also very interested I, in, in what I'm just for sake of argument call Cascadia, which would be Southeastern Alaska, uh, the Pacific Northwest and Northern California. We say, uh, the Copper River to the Russian River. I don't know if you know your rivers, but those are sort of what it kind of kind of brackets uh, brackets for us. So we're very interested. We all we already have an awful lot of partnerships across that go across the border, and and I'll, I'll talk about that in in a subsequent slide. But of course, we're also Canadians, so uh, we also should you know support our national our, our national systems, which we've done over the last few years. We're really starting to do that work a lot more with the government of Canada, work with our partners on the east coast of Canada in the Gulf of St. Lawrence and also in the Arctic to, uh, uh, to take more responsibility to, as I say, to grow up a little bit scientifically. Uh, we've worked a little bit around the, uh, around the North Pacific and, and until uh, we, uh, we've uh, sort of run out of uh, being able to work with Russia, we actually had quite an interest, there was quite an interesting round the, round the coast project on salmon that involved all the nations that the Russians were actually quite active in. So we do have an interest in the North Pacific as well. And finally, um, we are also interested in, you know, making our mark and, and being involved in the conversation globally in terms of the kinds of issues that we care about. Two um, particular things there, the green globe there is the, is the global ocean observing system. And if you kind of look up, you see AUS. Um, uh, Nanus in, in Pacific Northwest, Seus in Canada, all of these OOSs are ocean observation systems and they're all part of a global collaboration of organizations that are doing the same thing. So we want to be strong members of Goose, of Goose, and we are. The other thing that came along just about exactly the same time as we were thinking about our, what we were going to do in the decade was the United Nations Decade of Ocean Science for Sustainable Development. And I'll talk about that in a couple of slides now. And again, so that's an important area for us as we, as we grow up scientifically to move out into those other areas. Now, I'm showing you a couple of things just to give you an idea, uh, give you a couple of examples. When I talk about regional collaborations and working across British Columbia, you'll sort of know what I mean. So perfect example is seagrass monitoring. Uh, I think everyone knows how important seagrass is. So we're very interested. We monitor a lot of seagrass ourselves. But monitoring seagrass is labor intensive. It really is. And you know, you need partners to help you do it. So what we've really managed to do is recruit, we're looking to remove, uh, uh, recruit community partners who will work with us on seagrass monitoring. Most of them are BC First Nations. So here's a picture of what absolute, now good news is what an amazing seagrass meadow that is. The bad news is it's gonna take an awful long time to, to measure it all and figure out what's going on on it. And so it's, uh, it's, uh, it's difficult so that we really have, we've got a certain amount of experience about how to tackle problems like this. So we'll work with community partners and we say, first of all, you need a plan of attack. There's all sorts of ways that you approach this to do, to do seagrass monitoring. Sorry, I've just got a, somebody's decided to phone me here. Sorry. <laughs> Turn off your phone before you start something like this. The, uh, uh, so um, yeah, so we've got, uh, you know, want to work with the partners. We've got, we've got an idea about how to approach this. So first of all, we wanna, we wanna work with our partners to give them the tools so they can do this efficiently. We also, it's very important that if, we're, if you're putting your time in to study something, to do it properly and come away with data that's valid and come away with data that can be, that can be viewed with others. So we work an awful lot on, on training and mentorship to help our First Nations do problems like this. Now you may see in this picture, you'll see a little picture of a drone at the top of there. It turns out that a seagrass bed like this 
you can actually do quite a good job of, of measuring it and monitoring its extent using a drone. So you capture the drone imagery and then we, uh, we, turn, um, you know, we turn loose on it, um, um, the um, uh, machine, machine learning to detect, the, uh, you know, de detect where, the, where the seagrass is and that, that really helps things along. So you can only do so much with a drone. There's an awful lot of stuff as we got in the bottom corner there, all the details matter. It is seagrass, it's a grass, it's health and it's productivity depend upon studying an awful lot of things. So again, we've got a whole network of, of, of partner sites who are learning from us, working together and, 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 and working collectively on this problem. So that's what I mean by projecting our capability beyond our sites and, and getting more onto the, the, the coast of British Columbia. This in fact seagrass network that we work in here extends also across the uh, uh, across Alaska and, and down through the Pacific Northwest. So another thing, <clears throat> show me another example here is uh, really a big uh, collaboration that we've been involved in for many years across Cascadia, and that is studying ocean acidification. So if you look at the panel on the left there, you see all of that green area extending all the way from the Gulf of Alaska. It actually extends out the bottom of the picture as far south as San Diego. So these are a whole bunch of cooperating sites who are, where they're studying ocean acidification across that domain there. And as the key shows on the map, it's a mixture of moorings, i.e. Um, uh, buoys that are in the water and land-based stations. Now they're all monitoring uh, the, the ocean acidification on a continuous basis. And as that big red arrow shows, all this data goes to the global ocean acidification network portal in real time. So all of these sites are all collecting data off that, that across that big range. They're all cooperating and it's all going into the global, the global network, which is fantastic. If we take a look at some of these sites, for example, right up there on Calvert Island, um, we have a buoy. It's right at the junction of Fitzhugh and Quaxua Channel, if you know where that is, sitting in the water, and it's continuously monitoring ocean acidification of the water and also the atmosphere, sending out on Wi-Fi to our base uh, at, uh, uh, on, at, um, at the Hakai Institute, and then we send that out, out, out through the cloud and up to global acidification networks. So that's an example of one of these spots. It's got its brothers all up and down the coast. Now, uh, on one of the blue dots there, is our little field, our little shore station at Quadra Island. And um, you can see our tech there, Katie, she's sitting in her little house. Uh, she's monitoring the ocean. You can see it out through the far window there, um, pumping, uh, pumping seawater out of the bay through her instruments. And she's uh, studying and reporting, um, re reporting ocean acidification out to, the, out to the world from her little lab there just like all of the other sites up and down the coast. Now, if you look um, at Katie, if you're going to Katie's lab here, you'll see, um, you see the yellow box over there sitting on the bench, there's a bunch of beer bottles. So, you know, I think what's going on here? Well, it turns out that we have community partners, our shellfish growers, who of course are very interested in ocean acidification. So they're motivated to collect samples for us and you can see He's using the old beer bottle capper here to, 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 to snap a cap on the beer bottle and it's got a, an ocean sample in there that's gonna be sent over to Katie's lab and it's gonna go into, the, uh, <clears throat> it's gonna go into the, um, the machine. So you can see we're using our influence to build a broader network. We're growing up scientifically, not doing all the work ourselves. We're helping others and, and we're building a network around that. It doesn't stop here. We have what are called vessels of opportunity. And a vessel of opportunity for science is a vessel that's going somewhere on some sort of a mission. And you, know, you may be able to say to it, look, as long as you're going there, can you collect some scientific samples on, on route? And so we've had great cooperation. When the Alaska State Ferry Columbia was running, uh, which was prior to COVID, every time it went from Bellingham up to Skagway and back down to Bellingham again, it was collecting ocean, uh, collecting ocean samples continuously all the way along its route. Again, they were all going into our, into our center and then we were exporting them all to the world. So that was fantastic. We also have uh, instruments on the C-SPAN Royal, which if you, I don't know if you like tugboats, I love tugboats. This is an absolutely beautiful tugboat uh, that's based in Vancouver. And what it does is it hauls the log barge uh, around Vancouver Island and Haida Gwaii and all the way it's on its route, it's collecting data. So that's fantastic. So uh, that's again an example, and I'll show you the other thing we're interested in 
is these are scientific partners. The last two examples I've shown in terms of building a network. We're really interested in building uh, citizen science programs around what we do with a particular concentration on schools and on younger people to get them involved in science. So they're doing significant science, but maybe not at the same level as uh, you know, mapping seagrass in a, in a huge bed like that, which is a lot of work. So we're very interested in, in what we call Adopt a Light, uh, our Sentinels program, which we've started this year, which is you know, Adopt a Light Trap, um, community partners can use light traps to monitor dispersal of species of interest, such as Dungeness crabs. So we give them the, the light trap and we, um, we teach them how to use it. We teach them how to do all the analysis. We handle the data. And, um, you know, our targets are schools, science centers, marinas, naturalist societies in, in British Columbia. The, the uh, logos of some of our early adopters are there. Um, at the same time, we also, because I don't know, I won't have time to talk about it today, but at Hackeye, we do an awful lot of media. Uh, we do videos, we do instructional material. So we can also combine the experimental side with, uh, you know, the theory if people want to learn more about, uh, about biodiversity. And uh, so there's our, our, our Sentinel site so far in orange across the Canadian side. And we really benefit from the fact, and you may have already known this as I've been talking, the Pacific Northwest Crab Research Group in Washington State has already had a community science program going uh, south of the border. So they have a number of sites as well. And so we've learned a lot from them and we're kind of pooling our data. So we're actually getting quite a, an impressive number of, of Sentinel sites around, around the area. So I'm um, coming to the end here. Um, so, um, the UN decade, the what, the so what, and the now what. So I talked about how we were sitting at the start of the decade and saying, hmm, we should be doing something with the decade to kind of grow up and do something significant in ocean science. It turned out that the ocean, the UN, the United Nations was thinking about the same thing. So they declared the, 20, the, the, the 2020s to be the decade of ocean science for sustainable development. I could explain the ocean decade informally, its governments, governance structure, programs, projects, et cetera, et cetera. But for our purposes here, I'm just going to explain it as follows. The what and the, and the so what are exactly the same as, as our own. So exactly what I've been talking about, the kinds of things that we believe in, those I think are the principles that the UN decade of ocean science believes in. Right down to the know what. So it really matches, it just matches our philosophy really well. So the UN's decade of ocean science matches our own. It's ice fields to oceans, just like ours. It's natural science and social science. And it's an extension to traditional and indigenous knowledge. So it's not just, not just laboratory white coat science. Uh, they have a commitment also to long-term place-based place -based multidisciplinary ob observation. They say not nearly enough of this is being done. They also celebrate collaboration and coordinated programs, exactly like we do. That's how you get things done. And they also believe in, in building a, a movement for change that spreads far beyond the usual suspects in ocean science, i.e. Um, not just the scientists, to get effective, engaging stories and media out to really kind of inspire the public and, and, to, uh, and to get something done this decade. They also have a strong, uh, strong commitment to indigenous people and communities that have traditionally been neglected by ocean science. So what I say to people internally at, at, in our organization and to all of our partners, I say, look, trust me, we can throw our energy wholeheartedly behind the UN ocean decade without sacrificing any of our principles or objectives. It just, the program fits us like a glove. So I've been very enthusiastic about it. So, if I'm looking at something like the ocean decade, here's what I say. I say, you know, the UN is very good at setting aspirational goals for everyone, you know, and they provide inspiration and leadership and all that kind of thing can come from a global level. Well and good, but if you're talking about the now what, if you're talking about specific programs and projects that are actually going to make a difference, they're going to have to be, have a regional focus because science is done, science is done regionally. It's not done in some abstract, abstract way across the globe. The UN agrees with me and they identified the role for what they call <clears throat> regional collaborative centers. And these would be entities that match up these global initiatives with regional opportunities and needs so that they make sure that these programs are all meshed, that they're all working together in a coherent way. And also that they build upon pre-existing programs and networks because guess what? Prior to the ocean decade, we've been doing lots of great work 
in the in the Salish Sea and around the coast of uh, you know, along the Pacific coast, and we want to make sure that those existing programs are properly integrated with the new programs, including the ones that we do ourselves. So we volunteered. We we said that's a great job for us. We'd love to do that. The UN took us up on the offer, and they've asked us to take on the responsibility of being the collaborative center for the Northeast Pacific, which is a huge area. Everything, as we say, everything from Baja to the Aleutians. Uh, we're not supposed to do all the work, but we're in some way or other supposed to be catalytic to try to make the ocean, the, the UN ocean decade to create inspiration and, and activity across that big landscape. So it's, uh, it, it's not easy. So this is my last slide. And that is, as I say, you know, with the ocean decade, uh, we need your help. And that, that's basically a cry, cry for help. Um, as the uh, Hakai Institute, we've made our reputation by being independent, self-sufficient, able to commit to the long term on our local programs, and we won't stray from that. So we're still going to be doing all of the things you've seen in the past. But obviously, um, we're going to need an awful lot of help from everyone if we're going to do our job making the ocean decade a success across this vast region from Baja to the Aleutians, and also to Hawaii, by the way and across a vast array of themes and projects. Some of them we're good at, some of them we're not so good at. We've got to basically get, get you know, um, line up a lot of partners and we've been doing that. So how can we mobilize? You know, the question is, we have to answer the big challenging question for the ocean decade. Now what, is it gonna be all talk or are we actually gonna get something done this decade? <laughs> and so when I say here, as I say, everybody can help, everybody can help. Uh, you don't have to be a scientist, you don't have to be anything. So surely I think that the people in the, in the audience tonight are informed, motivated, influential people who know the ocean so well, and it could be a big help. Um, and uh, so how can people help? Well, first thing is just participate. Uh, the ocean decade is so broad that everyone can find a way to participate and lend support. Join up, receive our newsletter, learn about events, activities, ways to engage programs, uh, things for kids, things for your things for communities. I think though, you know, in some ways as boaters, maybe you can do a little bit more. Uh, you may be able to, because of all your connections and your interests and your expertise, you might be, you might be able to foster centers for citizen science, like the Sentinels programs that we're talking about. And it may be that, that there, it's a good way of kind of referrals to get, to get the community a little bit more involved. You might be able to get involved yourself. I mean, we've been hassling some people who've got who are traveling on boats to say, actually, maybe you could make your boat a vessel for opportunity for science. Maybe there are some some uh, data that could be collected um, just when you're, when you're out there. I know what it's like to travel the coast. Sometimes it's a bit boring. It's not a bad idea to have something to do. And yeah. uh, Eric, Eric, so we had, actually have one of that. Uh, we had a chat come in, and uh, somebody well, a voter is interested in uh, understanding how. So. That was your, I think it's your second bullet from the bottom here. And how can, uh, if voters are interested, do they uh, send you an email? A two well, I'll, I'll, I'll show the next slide, which will have a contacts on it. So if you just bear with me for, for, for one second here. So, yeah, so, I mean, I think there's stuff you can do. The other thing too is, of course, um, you know, we, we do have what we're calling a, an Ocean Community Foundation, which we're sort of setting up. And it's very much in the spirit of something like the Seattle Foundation, whatever. Yeah, and people can donate to it and support the many capable local organizations that need resources to participate. So, you know, some people have got the wherewithal to do these kinds of things, but some people they need to have a little bit of a little bit of financial support. So two ways to help participate and to donate. Now I'll go to the next page. So thanks a lot. Maybe we'll see you this summer. Uh, we have various websites. Uh, the one that is specifically to do with the ocean decade is ocean decade northeast pacific .org. And we're just basically getting it up to speed. Um, you can get in contact with us on, on, or you can follow us on Twitter. You can follow us on Instagram. And I am bravely putting my email address up there. And I'm saying, you know, if people, if people uh, find that they, you know, in these early stages that they need to have some additional help, I can, I don't mind being the traffic cop here and, and sending these queries on to the, to, the, to the right destinations. The other thing too is if you do come to the, Calvert Island, uh, you know, facility this year, you know, stop in, we'll be able to talk a lot about what we do. And of course, they know everything up there. I'm proselytized so much about the ocean decade that everybody knows all about it. So, uh, so that's fantastic. So I guess maybe what I'll do is stop sharing my screen. 
and um, and say um, I, I hope I haven't run over my time, but um, I uh, was. Um, it's always fun to talk about this stuff because it's very interesting, and it's great to be talking in front of people who I know know all about the area that I'm talking about, and so they can understand how we care so much about it. Well, that's fantastic. It's uh, very interesting. So, Lorena. Did we, have, did we have some questions in uh, the, the chat? The one was, uh, we had one that uh, inter somebody interested in uh, uh, learning how to participate as a voter, and I think your contact sheet that you had there looked good. We put something on chat uh, at tula.org to people, uh, get people there. Uh, they can get the recording and look at your contact information. And uh, the other one that I think uh, we had one other that... Um, it was a, a somebody was interested uh, that they're an active surveyor, and, uh, and also what uh, there was a question about the impact of fish farms on all of this. Do you have a, a statement on that? No, not really. I guess that that's been that's been a very divisive area politically. I know we have people on on all sides of that. Our our particular research doesn't bear upon that. So you know we 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 talk about the stuff that we do research in. You know we're right here, uh, and and I know it's it's uh, um, well certainly I think the shellfish aquaculture people seem to think it's pretty benign, and that that everybody thinks that that's that's not a not a bad thing to go ahead with. Uh, the fish farms are are in British Columbia, and I'm sure in Washington State they really are a lightning rod, and and uh, so that I think that we really they are they are being phased out. And uh, we haven't really been actively involved in the campaign. I'm in a bit of an awkward situation. We're right in Campbell River here, which is, which is the center of the industry. <laughs> I've got wives, I've got husbands and wives of people who work with me who are dependent upon it. So all, uh, we, we tend to sort of stand aside from that and say, this is maybe an area that we'll, uh, we'll let others carry the, carry the ball there. And of course, I've got many, many people who work for me who are very, very passionate uh, uh, about the issue. So uh, it's, it's not an area of active, uh, of active science for us. Although we do look at salmon, uh, we do look at, at, at migrating smolts. So on Quadra Island, um, we're right on the flight path of um, salmon smolts that come out of the Fraser River and, and, and head north up to the Gulf of Alaska. So we catch them as we're going by and we do inventories of them and we pass them on to uh, Department of Fisheries and Oceans and they look at them for viruses and they look at them for sea lice and everything else. So we're part of the, we're part of the scientific program, but it isn't an area that we write papers in or, or, or campaign in, but we, uh, we work closely with partners on that. And this is a very, very important area. Excellent. So I think uh, with that, I think we need to sign off here. But thank you very much, Eric. That was, that was excellent. Uh, Brian, anything else? No, great stuff. I mean, fascinating research and uh, applaud what you're doing. I mean, it's, it's amazing. I mean, we could go for hours on this, right? Yeah, probably. <laughs> but I won't. <laughs> That's for another time, for sure. Well, Eric, we appreciate you joining us uh, next week. Another exciting show on dynamic marine systems. I know, Leonard, Lorena, you may actually be out on your boat next week. So we'll talk about stabilizers and things like that uh, next time, next Thursday night. Hard to believe it'll be June by then. A lot of people on their boats. So uh, looking forward to that. Yeah. Good. good night, good everyone. Night. Have a good night. Take care.